Hi class, welcome to our first experiment with trying to do some online lectures. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about statistical significance. Last week we were reviewing confidence intervals and the way that you can tell how confident you can be in the results that you get from a sample. Significance tests are similar to confidence intervals as we'll be talking about later on, but with a few differences that we're going to be uh, really talking about and digging into in this lecture. So we have seen how the properties of the sampling distribution of a sample mean help us to estimate the range of the likely values for the population mean, which we call mu. But we can also rely on this in order to test a hypothesis. And the way that we test a hypothesis, just to give an example, is let's say that you are in charge of the quality control for a food company. And you can't, of course, sample all of the tomato packs that your company puts together. But you know that the packs are supposed to be about a half pound, about 227 grams. So you randomly sample four packs of those cherry tomatoes and you weigh them. Now the average weight from the four boxes that you sample was 222 grams. This is lower than it's supposed to be, and that can pose a problem. You know, perhaps you're worried about a lawsuit taking place, people saying that they're not getting the cherry tomatoes that they were promised. So how do we tell if what we got from those four particular boxes applies to the larger population of boxes, or whether we just happened to pick four boxes that had a lower than normal uh, sample mean? Well, the way that we do this is we try to test a hypothesis. So when we talk about a test of statistical significance, what we're trying to do is we're trying to test a specific hypothesis. And we've encountered hypotheses before, where we're comparing two things when we talk about the expectations. One of our running examples, for example, is that in comparison of individuals, we expect those who are younger to be less likely to vote than those who are older. So in this case, when we're talking about cherry tomatoes, what we're trying to test is whether or not the mean of those cherry tomato boxes is equal to 227 grams. In other words, whether on average we end up getting cherry tomato packages that are the weight that we're promising on the packaging. And what we're specifically testing is something called a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis, which we oftentimes label as H sub zero, is talking about the population. And specifically, it's talking about whether or not there is a difference between the population that we think that we ought to be in and the population that we get from our sample. So our null hypothesis in this case would be that there is no difference between the population of cherry tomato packages and what we say that population should be. In this case, that it should be 227 grams on average. The alternative hypothesis is stating what we think might be going on outside of the null hypothesis, and it's oftentimes labeled H sub A. So we could do this in one of two ways. We could say that our alternative hypothesis is that there is less than 227 grams in the cherry tomato packages that are coming off the line, or we could say simply that the packages that are coming off the line are not where they're supposed to be, that the population mean is not equal to 227 grams. This gets us into the two different kinds of alternative hypotheses that we can have. And these are usually referred to as one-tail or two-tail tests, or one-sided one or two-sided tests. Both of these are used interchangeably. In a two-tail or a two-sided test, Essentially what we're trying to look at with the null and alternative hypothesis is a null hypothesis where we think that the population mean is equal to a specific number and an alternative hypothesis where we simply say that the population mean is not equal to that number. A one-tail test makes a little bit further assumption. It talks about the direction which we think that the population mean might miss that specific number by. Our null hypothesis is still the same. We still think that the population mean is equal to a specific number. But our alternative now is either that the population mean is less than that number or that the population mean is greater than that number. So as an example, when the FDA tests whether a generic drug has an absorption rate or an effect similar to what a brand name drug has, both higher absorption, so 
overdosing or lower absorption, not getting enough of a dose, are a problem. And thus, if we were trying to test this, we would utilize a two-sided test, where our null hypothesis is that the generic brand has the same absorption rate as the name brand. And our alternative hypothesis would be that the generic brand does not have the same absorption rate as the name brand. This would be a two-sided or a two-tail test. So how do we choose between these? Well, what determines the choice really is based upon the question that we're trying to ask. In other words, do we have a strong reason for assuming that the population mean would be greater than that specific number or less than that specific number? Unless we have a really strong reason to believe one or the other, then we should end up defaulting to a two-tailed test. Um, the example which is given here in the slide talks about nicotine content. Uh, the one thing that we often do in the social sciences is we default to a two-tailed test. And the reason is because, as we'll see later on, it's easier to pass a test of statistical significance if you're doing a one-tailed test than it is to pass a test of statistical significance if you're using a two-tailed test. And it's all too tempting to decide after you have your study results that, you know what, a one-tailed test is good enough, or I expected my results to be this way the entire time. In fact, there's even a cognitive bias for this, that uh, researchers tend to assume once they see their results that those results were obvious the entire time. So oftentimes we default, and most of my examples will be of two-tailed tests. In order to test the null hypothesis, we calculate what's called a p-value. And a p-value looks essentially at the uh, probability that you could end up getting results uh, that you got in your sample if the null hypothesis were true. It assesses the believability of the null hypothesis given the evidence that's provided by the random sample. A good way to think about this is to think about the null hypothesis and to think about p-values similar to how we think about guilty versus not guilty in a court of law. You'll notice that in a court of law, we never declare anyone innocent, right? And the defense never has to prove that their client is innocent. They just have to prove that there is not enough evidence for the client to be guilty. So similarly, in statistics, we assume that the population mean is that number that we set in the null hypothesis unless we have enough evidence from our sample to prove that it's very unlikely that that's the case. We interpret p-values on the basis of their size. A small p-value means that random variation from the sample is very unlikely to account for the difference between the sample and our, hypo our, our hypothetical population. So if we have a small enough p-value, we reject the null hypothesis. And we say that the true property of the population is significantly different from what is stated in the null hypothesis. Going back to our tomatoes example, if there is only a small probability that that sample of four boxes that we took off the line could have been generated just by random chance. We just happened to get four boxes that had less, um, a lower amount of weight than the true population. If there's a low probability of that, a low p-value, then we can reject the null hypothesis that the machine is functioning properly, and we probably go back and recalibrate our machine. But how low of a p-value do we need to have? How significant does a finding need to be before we end up rejecting it? This slide shows you several different examples of p-values. And this goes all the way back to when we were talking about z-scores in the normal distribution. So if you have the area under the curve that represents the probability of getting a result as large or larger or as small or smaller than a particular z-score, you can have in the upper left-hand corner a two-tailed test where you're looking at both sides of the distribution that is 0.2758. So there's about a 28% chance that the differences observed between the sample and our hypothetical population mean that we're testing um, 
are due simply by the fact that we just happened to get a sample that was a little bit low or a little bit high. Um, in converse to this, if you go to the bottom right hand corner, there you have a difference. Again, this is a two-tailed difference where the probability, the p-value, is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.01, excuse me. That means that there is only a 1% chance that we would have gotten those results on the basis of random sampling error. Now we can make two kinds of errors. One type of error is what we call type 1 error. And this is made when we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is actually true or we incorrectly reject a true null hypothesis. This would be similar to incorrectly declaring someone not guilty when they actually committed the crime. And we oftentimes label type 1 error as the significance label alpha. A type 2 error is made when we fail to reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is false. So we incorrectly keep a false null, null hypothesis. The probability of making a type 2 error is labeled beta. And the power of a test, which we won't get into a lot in this class, but you can read more about it in your book, is 1 minus beta. When we run a test of significance, we try to strike a balance between the chance, of, uh, the chance alpha of making a type 1 error and the chance beta of making a type 2 error. Reducing alpha reduces the power of the test. In other words, it reduces the likelihood that we will find a statistically significant result and increases beta. It might be tempting to emphasize the idea of just trying to get statistically significant results, and many researchers fall into this trap. However, what can end up happening is if you continually design your experiments to influence the amount of statistical significance. In other words, if you continually try to increase the numbers of your sample, you can end up having a situation where very, very trivial effects become highly significant. In the social sciences, we generally put the emphasis on preventing type 1 error. We, similar to a court system, we have a presumption that the null hypothesis is true. And only when we get a strong indication of evidence that the null hypothesis is not true do we reject the null hypothesis. A standard level of statistical significance, alpha, is 0.05, meaning that there is only a 5% chance that the differences between our sample and our hypothetical population are due simply to the sample that we drew. So let's get into doing a test for the population mean. How do we know if the sample from which we've drawn our data is significantly different from some kind of hypothetical population that we have? Um, we'll start with an unknown population mean. So we don't know what the population mean is. We can't know this, right? We can't go out and sample 300 million Americans every time we want to know what they think about the presidential election. But we're going to assume for now that we know the standard deviation, sigma, of the population. This is a somewhat unrealistic assumption, but you know, as with our confidence intervals, we're going to make that assumption for now, and then we're going to relax it next week. As we've talked about before, the p-value is the area under the sampling distribution for values at least as extreme in the direction of our alternative hypothesis. In other words, in the direction of our random sample. And we utilize a tool that we've utilized many times before, our z-scores. So what we do to calculate these z-scores is we take our sample mean, we subtract the hypothetical population mean, and then we divide that by the standard deviation, sigma, of the population, divided by the square root of n. And as we've noticed before, the larger your sample, the more likely it is, the more exact your estimates are going to be from your sample of the population mean, and therefore the lower your p-values are going to end up being. The higher, the higher your z-scores, the lower your p-values are going to end up being. Here is an illustration of what p-values look like for one-sided and two-sided tests. 
So the top chart shows you what it looks like for a one-sided test where we think that there is in fact that the, popula the true population mean is higher than what our hypothetical population mean is. And in that case, we are looking at the area under the sampling distribution above our z-score. If we think that the real population mean based on our sample is less than our hypothetical population mean, our null hypothesis, then we're looking at the lower end of our sampling distribution. For a two-tailed test, we utilize the fact that the normal distribution is symmetrical and we look at the values that are at least as far away from zero, a zero z-score as the z-scores that we calculate. So we're looking at, we can calculate this in a couple of different ways. We can either find out the two and add them together, or we can take two times the uh, uh, p-value that we calculate in a one-tailed distribution. This is, by the way, the reason why a two-tailed test will always produce higher values than a one-tailed test for the same z-score. It's because in any situation, a two-tailed test will produce a p-value that is two times the p-value for a one-tailed test. All right, so let's work through our example and ask ourselves, does the packaging machine for our tomatoes, does it need to be revised? So our null hypothesis is that the population mean is 227 grams. This is what we've put on the package. This is what that machine was programmed to do. Our alternative hypothesis is that in fact, the population mean is not 227 grams. So what is the probability, based upon the four packages that we pulled off the line, what is the probability of getting that result, the 222 grams that we observed as the average of those four packages, just by chance, if the true population mean is 227 grams? So our X bar, our sample mean is 222 grams. Uh, we are assuming that the uh, standard deviation is about 5 grams. And our n, which is the number of units we took to sample, is 4. To calculate the z-score, we take 222 minus 227, our hypothetical population mean, and divide it by 5 divided by the square root of 4. And this gives us a z-score of negative 2. Now if we go to table A, which we've been using since week two of this course, and we look at the probability of getting a z-score less than negative two, we find that that probability is 0 0.0228. Now since we are only testing whether the machine is off, we're not testing if it's off necessarily in a low or a high direction, because we, don't, we didn't know before we took our sample whether or not it'd be off in a low or a high direction. We're doing a two-tailed test, so we multiply that p-value by two, and we get a result of 0 0.0456, which essentially tells us that there's a 4.56% chance that we would have gotten that result simply by random chance. That's pretty low, and it's well below the standard alpha that we utilize, 0.05 or a 5% chance of it being due to random sampling error. And so because of this, from our sample, if we're using these criteria, we would say that yes, the machine does seem to be off, and we probably need to try changing it a little bit. We need to recalibrate it in order to get closer to what we're advertising is the amount of tomatoes that are in each package. Again, reviewing this idea of significance level. The significance level alpha is the largest p-value tolerated for rejecting a true null hypothesis. So it's essentially how much evidence against the null hypothesis we require. And it has to be decided before conducting the test. This actually dates back to um, very early development of statistics. When uh, a statistician was asked, well, what do you consider statistically significant result? And he said, well, I think about five times out of 100. If it happens less than five times out of 100, that seems statistically significant. The reality is, is that p-values could be set 
at any level. And a lot of the times, which p-value you choose depends upon how costly the action is that you're going to be taking. So for example, I said that the 0.05 level, uh, the p-value alpha of 0 0.05, is pretty standard in the social sciences. If we set the value to that, to 0 0.05, or a 5% level, then we would say that, yes, our result is statistically significant, and the packaging machine needs revision. If we would have set it lower, let's say that we were you know, wanting to make sure that there was only a 1% chance that we would get these results because of random sampling error. Well, then the p-value would not be statistically significant. And the way that this is decided is oftentimes arbitrary, uh, oftentimes determined by past practices. Um, however, you can also think about it this way. If it was relatively easy for us to change our packaging machine, to recalibrate it, then we would probably pick a higher level of, a higher p-value level, a higher level of alpha, than we would if it was expensive to recalibrate it. If it was expensive to recalibrate it, we would want to be very, 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 very sure that something was off before we did the recalibration. If it's not very expensive to recalibrate it, we might say that we are willing to recalibrate it based on much less evidence. Again, if we're analyzing this in terms of like a court of law, think about the difference between a civil case versus a criminal case. In a criminal case, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's preponderance of evidence. Similar, and the reason is because of the severity of the punishment based on those two crimes. Um, similarly, depending upon the severity of the action that needs to be taken in response to results, we might alter our level of statistical significance. But it must be done before we do our test. So we can also test this by using z-scores directly. And a higher z-score or a lower z-score, so the further away a z-score is from zero, the less likely it is that you would have gotten that result. And so sometimes what you might do is you might take a look at what's called a rejection region. So you might say in order to have a 0.05 rejection level, you'd need to have a z-score at least a certain amount away from zero. And we can look at whether the z-score is greater than that rejection area. If you go to table C, you can see the rejection regions. Um, and you can see that usually a z-score for a two-tailed test, a z-score greater than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96 is going to cause you to say that a result is statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do at this point is to pause the video. Here is a problem for you to try. Go ahead and try the problem, and then in a little while, I will move on to, and then unpause the video, and we'll go on to the answer. Pause the video now. All right, let's look at the answer for this problem. In this case, what we're trying to test is whether or not there is a big difference between the overall population and the population of Texas. So we take 49, which is what we got in our sample, minus 52, which is what we think the overall population looks like, and then we take 4 divided by the square root of 100. When we do this, we get a result of negative 7.5. And if you look at your normal distribution table, we notice that anything below a negative 1.96 has a probability less than 0.025. And 0.025 times 2 is 0.05. Thus, we look at this and we would say that clearly this passes our threshold for statistical significance. People in Texas do seem to have a different opinion of President Obama, and we can reject our null hypothesis. Now let's try this again, and let's alter a few things. Let's alter how many people are in our sample, and let's alter what happens if the sample mean is changed. Go ahead and pause the video and try this out on your own.
I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the answers to this. Um, you can go through and calculate these yourselves and check your answers. The slides are all posted online, but make sure that you got the right results. There are two things that are important in this. The first one is that as the population that you sample gets larger, then the ability to reject the null hypothesis also increases. Your z-scores get further away from zero. Alternatively, as your sample mean gets closer to your hypothetical population mean, it becomes more difficult to reject the null hypothesis. So as the differences get smaller, you need a larger sample in order to get a statistically significant result. So the probability of making a type 1 or a type 2 error is dependent upon your sample size and the magnitude of the difference between the sample mean x bar and the population mean mu. This is all very similar to what we did with confidence intervals. So if you had a sample mean that, was with, that had a confidence interval that includes the null hypothesis value, then you could not reject the null hypothesis. If that confidence interval does not include the uh, hypothetical population mean, does not include the value of your null hypothesis, then you can reject the null hypothesis. And it looks something like this. Okay, so if our, this is an example where we got a sample mean of 0.84. We drew a 99% confidence interval that goes from about 0.83 to 0.85. If we had as our null hypothesis that the population mean was 0 0.85, we could not reject the null hypothesis at the 99% level of confidence. If our null hypothesis suggested that the population mean was 0 0.86, then we could reject the null hypothesis. There's one, a couple of last things that we need to note here. The first one is that statistical significance only says whether the effect observed is likely due to chance alone because of random sampling. It doesn't mean that the results you get are practically important. That's because statistical significance doesn't tell you the magnitude of the effect. It only tells you if there is an effect, if there is a difference. An effect could actually be too small to be relevant. And a lar with a large enough sample size, we could get statistical significance even with the tiniest of effect. So um, for example, you know, we, if we were testing a drug to lower a, a person's body temperature, we could find that it um, lowers a patient's temperature by 0 0.4 degrees Celsius with a p-value of 0 0.01. And we could base this off of a sample of thousands and thousands of people. And so we could be really, really sure that it reduces patient temperature by about 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. However, for doctors, in order for a um, drug to have a clinically beneficial effect, it needs to decrease the temperature by at least one degree Celsius. And this drug doesn't do that. So therefore, while we found a statistically significant effect, it doesn't mean that we found a practically significant effect. The other thing to be aware of is the inverse of this. So you can have a situation where you do your study, you run your results, and you don't find an effect. It can oftentimes be the situation where you have too little leverage in order to find statistical significance. Maybe you only sampled a few people. Maybe you only looked at a, a small number of cases. And so you could have a situation where you need to go out and collect more data in order to find out whether the effect is really statistically significant or not. Um, Similarly, you know, it, just because you don't have enough proof that someone committed a murder does not mean that the murder was not committed or necessarily that that person didn't do it. It means that you go out and you check to see if maybe you need to get a larger sample size. So this is overall, these are a couple of cautions to be aware of when we talk about statistical significance. Statistical significance doesn't mean that it's substantively important and a lack of statistical significance doesn't mean that there isn't a relationship.
What it does tell us though, is it does tell us whether in the study that you are doing, if there is enough evidence to suggest that you should reject your null hypothesis. And this can be quite valuable in a number of ways that we're going to talk about throughout the semester. So thank you for watching this. Um, for our classes this week, uh, your TA is going to be taking th you through several different uh, practice problems. He's also going to be covering some of the additional uh, topics related to statistical significance and making sure that you understand what we're talking about when we talk about statistical significance versus substance significance. Um, if you need to, please download these slides. Please read the book chapter as well to make sure that you get, that you get a good understanding of this topic. And we will meet again next week.